Colin McLaughlin, this is literally the sports doctor, guys. And that he is. And Jim Klein, you on the phone there? Yeah, I sure am, man. It's great to be back. You remember that from two years ago? He's still the sports doctor, man. He's just not calling COVID anymore. He's back in the booth on the on the headphones tonight. We're calling women's volleyball, and that's exactly where everyone should be. These kids put their heart and soul into the game. Nobody gets the coverage like football in the fall. I completely get that. Played football in high school. The boys don't deserve anything taken away from them, but these female athletes, they work just as hard. They're there in the gym all summer doing everything that they need to do to prepare for the fall, and we've got a great matchup as Musselman starts his quest for a four-peat tonight with the sports doctor on play-by-play. And Jim, you and I back on the call, even though uh, earlier today you thought it was uh, Dylan on the call. I saw your post on Facebook, and we were a little confused. What did you mean by the safari hat, Spencer wanted me to ask first off? Yeah, so Dylan's Facebook picture shows him wearing a safari hat, and I was like, dude, I didn't even know you were in the Congo. But He doesn't uh, use Facebook, have it be noted. Yeah, there you go. So at some point in time, Dylan had texted me. I I was at an an event about two and a half weeks ago, and I learned of an injury to um, a pretty significant player on one of the rosters who who was actually – that their team is actually playing tonight. And I had texted him, and I thought that he had told me he was doing Thursdays. Um, That text long since deleted. Clearly my mistake. I will not make those kind of mistakes live on the air. Facebook, I called a timeout. I called a timeout and said someone from TV10 will be on the headphones. And then Spencer later confirmed that the sports doctor comes out of women's sports retirement to make the call tonight. A little true there. I mean, I was doing some uh, girls basketball and some softball with – uh, our crew here over the. I think you filled in for Jim. On a I think I filled in one time yeah, for Jim yeah. when you're on vacation. But yeah, I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, Jim, as you already mentioned, Spring Mills and Musselman, a young Spring Mills team, but a team that uh, so far has looked pretty good. Yeah, Spring Mills had, had a loss against very good competition. I think that was uh, Morgantown or university, I can't remember. I was looking at that earlier, and I don't want to talk too much about Spring Mills and Musselman since we've got them, you know, this evening. But Musselman, I think, is the bigger story with six seniors who left, Hutzler, Howard, Walker, Miller, um, Weatherholtz, and Franklin. And, of course, uh, four of those started, Hutzler, Howard, you know, Hannah Howard, a Gatorade Player of the Year, Walker, and Miller. Um all who continued to uh, to do great things for that for that that school, um, I think that Musselman being at home gives them an advantage, even as they're trying to work through some of the the kinks. They lost to a a very good team down in South Carolina. I think uh, I, I I went to lunch one day during the summer and I talked to one of the Spring Mills players. She was very excited about the upcoming season. She thinks that they're going to be very good. Uh, I talked with um, a couple different people over the last couple weeks who say that Spring Mills' new head coach is very good and that uh, they're prepared to to do battle. So I think it's going to be an interesting matchup tonight. Spring Mills has always had some size. We know that Sammy Stevens can bring it. What is she, 6'2", 6'3"? She's going to go across the middle, run some opposite. And then um, I think that Gracie Kane is going to come out and play very, very well. Early in the season, it's all about ball control and communication. Musselman's running a very new uh, offense. Chrisman, of course, is probably not running opposite anymore. For the last three years, she's been on the right side. It'll be interesting to see how that timing switches up as she moves left side or even middle, then who's going to fill in for Howard's spot. Lots of stuff to talk about tonight you know, when, the, when, when the coverage starts. The rest of the EPAC also is in action with Hedgesville hosting Jefferson and Martinsburg host, hosting Washington. Both have potential to be very intriguing matchups. And, and Jim, Quest for a 4 P begins tonight. How do you see that? Do you see that happening uh, this year? What would the path be for Musselman? Well, the, the path for, for Musselman is going to be challenging. I mean, there's no question about it. The, the 
strength that they have is their experience through club ball and the fact that they're a powerhouse, a dynasty, if you will, who never rebuilds. They're constantly reloading. So I would imagine that Coach Martz is working a lot on the intricacies of their rotation, their uh, coverages, um, players being expected to be in new roles. I mentioned specifically Chrisman. There's no question about it. Winning a state title is very, very difficult. Uh, one of the seasons where I had a Washington Post top five team, we fell short. We ended up winning three titles, but there is nothing more challenging than winning a state volleyball tournament. And I think that, you know, odds are that Musselman will not four-peat. They're going to have to prove everything that they can against the entire state with basically a new starting lineup. Watcher and Ada McCoy, I think, and Chrisman are going to be the three starters, but we've already mentioned Chrisman being in a completely new a new role. It, it's, I think it's going to be difficult. I think Bianca Hutzler is going to come in, and she's going to set as a sophomore running the 6-2. There's just so many moving parts in this that four-peat is going to be very, very difficult, I think. Jim, uh, when you look at it, how do you see the other teams in the EPAC stacking up? Well, that's a great question. So we, we have been informed, I was informed very spe- specifically from the head coach at Hedgesville that they suffered an injury. The extent of that injury at the time was not known. Um, I'm not going to speculate. I don't want to talk about that player's name out of respect for that player and that team. Hedgesville hosts Jefferson tonight. I think when they take the floor, we'll know whether or not they're going to have one of their big guns. Hedgesville also lost a number of players. And most significantly for me is Paige Richmond, the setter. But they also lost some front row uh, from Miller and Van Dyne. They lost some back row and versatility and Gum and Willis. They lost Hahn and Shropshire. So Hedgesville also is a team that has to reload. Their expectation is that Parker Sutherland, Gracie Brown, Jayana Ware are going to provide enough offense to be able to rebound. But no matter what, when you lose that many key players to it, and remember, Hedgesville upset Musselman to win the, the, the regional championship. Hedgesville is no slouch. Jefferson, on the other hand, goes to Hedgesville, which is a very tough place to play especially when their new head coach, Coach Washington, Anna Washington, wasn't even named head coach until July 17th. However, Washington wins a pe- brings a pedigree for winning. She won a state title at Winfield. She coached Nitro and took them to their only state playoff appearance. So there's got to be some belief that Lowe, uh, Ripa's, um, Brianna Flores, that they're going to bring some of that senior talent to the table. Washington has proven that she can win in other places. Jefferson, I think, is probably the biggest unknown in the EPAC. Hedgesville faces their own challenges. Uh, Should be an interesting matchup. Then you go to Washington at Martinsburg. Washington, on paper, should be decent. I I mean, they return seniors. We we called them last year. I I don't know if you recall. Martinsburg and Washington had a five-set thriller. I kind of felt like... Martinsburg just got away from their, 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 their game plan, and Washington ended up stealing that match. They returned some decent players. Autumn Penwell's real good. Tintendo played well for them last year. Martinsburg is, is, has got to work on passing and ball control. That's what we saw last year. They gave up too many free balls. They ended up in situations where they had plenty of offensive power in Fennell and some of the other players on the team, we know that Bishop can bring it. We know Mosby. We know that uh, Strobel, who had been running on the right side, she had seven kills the other night and a loss to Handley. Uh, Martinsburg could be decent as well. I think Washington and Martinsburg could be a close matchup tonight. Um, the home team's Martinsburg, so it's their court. It's their match to lose. Jim, you kind of touched on it earlier that it's going to be tough for Musselman to four-peat just because of how much they've lost and what they have left after that. Could you see any of the teams then go as far to maybe saying dethrone them when it comes to sectionals and regionals? I know last year it was Hedgesville that won sectionals, but Musselman won regionals, I believe, unless I have that flipped. Well, see, so here, then you're, you're, I'm sorry, I'm sure you're right. The, my my whole thing is is that it, dethroning a champion, a, a team that has so many banners in the ceiling, is going to be difficult. It, it, but it's about a confidence thing. Whichever team can figure out that they've got the chance to win, regardless of their record or regardless of what has happened in the past, having that short term memory when they step into that thirty by sixty box 
that's what they've got to figure out. They, they can't get into that situation where, oh, here we go again. Musselman's just going to run the table. M- Musselman has challenges of its own. As strong as they are when they return, you know, Ana McCoy signed, a, uh, I think, a D1 contract down in South Carolina. They, like, they've got good players. But even the best of players don't necessarily manifest the best of teams. And, th- and that's the problem when you look at a sport like volleyball because no one player can do it all. You can't pass to yourself or pass set and then and, and then put the ball away you're, you're relying on the entire team doing something in unison on every play so very early communication ball control those are the things at this point in time in the season I wouldn't expect to see as many of the huts the quicks the shoots all of those types of things working on offense but more important working on transition speed from defense to offense not giving free balls it's going to be tough for Musselman, but there's, you know, for me, looking at them as a champion, I'm not ready to say that anybody can beat them until they prove it in their side of the court. Jim, we'll get you out of here on this one. Uh, what if I told you 92,003 fans show to a college football stadium to see a volleyball match that happened last night, Volleyball Day in Nebraska, sets the world record for uh, a highest attendance for a woman's sports event. Uh, what does that mean to the sport of volleyball specifically as a volleyball coach that you have been? Well, it's, it's a sign that women have finally reached the stage with the respect that they deserve. In two, December of 2000, I went to see Wisconsin play Nebraska in Richmond in the Final Four. They played each other in the national championship game. And in college, after the first two sets, they go to the locker room. They have a 15-minute intermission. And I went up to the, to the, to the box to order a T-shirt. And I, you know what I ended up doing? I ended up buying a Wisconsin and a Nebraska t-shirt because both teams, they were outstanding. And I, the pride that I had in watching those teams play, they ended up going to five sets. Nebraska won the championship. So I was at a national finals. I watched Nebraska win. So you know darn well I was paying full attention. Nebraska had been publishing all week, um, asking people to please tune in to the Big Ten Network last night to watch that match. Uh, my, my, my only... Uh, Druther would be, I wish they were playing Penn State, or I wish they were playing another top 10 opponent, because I think that that would have added a, a, a little bit more to it. But the fact is, they pulled it off. It was a world record. Congratulations, Nebraska Cornhuskers. I think they're ranked number four in the country right now. It's good for women's sports. It's good for volleyball. It's just a feel-good story. And we're going to hope to uh, rival that with 92,000 fans of our own watching tonight. Right, Colin? Absolutely. All right, Jim. Thanks for the time. We'll see you tonight.